agradecidos. I'll switch to English later. Yeah. De que eh, Klaus Wittenbach, eh, director del virtual y el director de la de MoMA, decidiera eh, visitarnos para conocer un poco lo que está pasando en teoría y conocer eh, un poco de lo que está ocurriendo en el campo artístico acá. Eh, se había anunciado en teoría que iba a hablar específicamente de eh, un proyecto que Klaus curó eh, para el MoMA, que era la retrospectiva de Marina Ramovich eh, que la verán en la presentación, pero Klaus a la vez te digo como hablar también de otros proyectos que ha hecho dentro de la ejecución, sobre todo como, como, como curar performance y como artes vivas de, dentro de su programa. Entonces no solamente verán de Abramovich, sino como cosas que ha hecho dentro de la ejecución. Eh, y yo, pues, sin embargo, sí quería hacerle como también como una especie de puente eh, en relación a la misma historia de teorética y es que tal vez algunos eh, tuvieron la oportunidad de visitar la exposición Estrecho de Oso y bien su estudio de los pibes en los informes por cambiar el interés de edad como pensamos la charla va a ser en inglés entonces es un poco como esto es un poco de tu mente bridge eh, tu parte de tu vida We just wanted to point out something that uh, would be interesting to uh, remind the audience here. And um, most of the people here yet are related to, to the work of Marina Ramovic, not only because she's clearly a reference to contemporary art, uh, but in 2006, actually, Tamara uh, Villas, who was the curator here at Teoretica, and Virginia Perez Razón, the public director. Uh, made this huge large scale exhibition in 2006, where they included a lot of contemporary uh, from Central America, but having like this international artist. And one of those were as kind of like points of references. And Abramovich was part of that exhibition with this piece. Uh, this is the catalog of that exhibition in 2006. And the work was um, an iconic work of Abramovich, where she says goodbye to Ule, her colleague and companion, and they made a piece where she would walk from uh, different points of the wall of China uh, as this grand gesture, kind of like symbolizing this grand and historical uh, collaboration. So this was a piece that was actually shown here in Teoretica and at the Museum of Contemporary Art, an exhibition that took like various uh, venues. Yeah? Uh, that was like a little bit of introduction and we start with your presentation. Yeah, but thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, Marina is actually guilty for getting me here because I'm actually on the way to Rio. Uh, there's a Rio Film Fest and there's a movie on the exhibition we did at MoMA and it's premiering in Rio on Friday. So, so mm -hmm. I saw Inti somewhere in Europe, I can't remember where, last week, and I said, oh wow, I'm going to Rio, I'm stopping by in Costa Rica. And it's, that's kind of pretty much how it was, right? <laughs> and so we cut the day, today is the day, 23 hours. Um, too late, I thought I should have brought the movie in tea. Yeah. Because it's actually quite a beautiful movie. It's 90 minutes, it's a real movie, and it really works in the movie theater. So I think I'll send you a copy. So if you're interested, you can screen it, whatever. Yeah. It's, quite, it's quite nice. I think I have the strangest title of every, any curator ever, right? It sounds very funny. <laughs> Everybody makes jokes in New York about this title, whatever, so. Um, and I thought I should talk a little bit about how you get such a crazy title and how you work as a curator. Um, I grew up near Cologne. And I think when I grew up in Cologne, Cologne was the center of the art world because right now there's perhaps Rosemarie Trockel, Gerhard Richter, Andreas Gorski, all those guys living there. But literally everybody lived there in the 80s. Like Jeff Koons, Mike Kelly, everybody was in Cologne. And then all of a sudden Cologne collapsed and everybody moved to Berlin or moved to New York. Or So Cologne is dead now, but still where I'm from. So. So I was 20 miles away from Cologne in Düsseldorf and I was such a loser. I never made it to Düsseldorf or Cologne when Joseph Beuys was alive. 
and Joseph Boyce is my main, main hero as an artist. And, but I saw him on TV, I must have been like 12 or so. He was singing on TV and I loved it. Um, most of you are too young to remember that there was an American president, Ronald Reagan, of course you remember him, but you don't remember how anxious Europe was because everybody th thought in Europe there's gonna be a third world war. I grew up thinking, oh God, tomorrow we are gonna be dead. And that was not like fantasy. I, I really, I remember it waking up and I said, God, we have another day. So it was literally the Cold War was literally, God, tomorrow you're going to die. And then Joseph Boyce, because Ronald Reagan was such an asshole. So in German, the word Reagan and Regen is nearly the same word. It means, it means rain. And he said, I want sunshine instead of Reagan. I want sun, sunshine instead of rain. And he sang this on TV and it became a hit. So I saw Joseph Boyce singing on TV, protesting against American Ronald Reagan. And I thought, wow, he's so cool. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying art is political. Art has to do with society. And art has to be responsible. Art is a form of disobedience. And art is a way of putting yourself right in the midst of it. Sounds funny, but I think I really mean that. And I think he did this. He died too young, but yeah. He founded our Green Party, which was like, wow, there's an artist and he founds a party. So, of course, you know kind of what he's kind of like talking about social sculpture, but then you talk about contemporary practice. And what I thought is important for me is that lots of things happen in the gallery, we're in the gallery, but there's a public space. We've just been, Carlos, like we've just been on the street. And I think your talk was really, really beautiful because you see how art kind of propels out of the protected era and area into the real world. And then all of a sudden it's not protected anymore, which is, I think, really interesting, especially with media. We drove from the airport today, and I think next week you have a Lady Gaga concert here or something, <laughs> and she wants to be in the art world, and she talks to the art world, means she talks to curators and artists, but she does a lot of things that are exactly what you are saying. She appropriates, and she takes, and she looks, and so I think it's actually interesting that the mainstream takes these ideas, and we come a little bit towards it later. Uh, going to to going to this space. Uh, this is the space I founded in Berlin. It's called KW. It's KW. It's the Institute of Contemporary Art. It's also the the institution that runs the Berlin Biennial. Mm -hmm. And when I was a student, I was a medical student. I did an internship in the government in East Berlin because I was from the West. And they thought like, wow, you're from the West, you've been to New York, you know how systems work. I don't know what they meant. So when I was 23, they gave me this totally wrecked ruin. And it was really interesting because there was 23, a medical student having this pile of shit to take care of. You see a porta potty, the blue is at the outside toilet. So. Uh, I started this with 23 and it's actually still there, which is very nice. It's 20 years later, it's still there. It's like, wow, that's kind of nice. So I'm going through a couple of slides. I did a show in, an ex in the street where KW is. It's in Auguststraße. And like I basically made every single room in the street, a church, a hospital, some storefronts, a basement, a toilet. I made all of them exhibition spaces. It was in 92, and that kind of like galvanized that area as an art area. A year later, we showed Douglas Gordon, 24-hour psycho. I don't know if you, Inti, was that ever shown here in Costa Rica? It's basically just a, me does anybody, everybody know the movie Psycho? Because it's really old, but you. When I was younger, people used to watch movies in theaters, and I think now you watch them on your computer, it's like super different. But I watched that in a theater, and just imagine slowing it down, and it's like 24 hours long. So there's one scene, Janet Lee, and the camera goes into her eye, like, that's this scene. 
and the camera is just going closer, zooming in onto the eye, and that's perhaps like 20 seconds in the movie. When you slow it down, it's seven minutes, so you like, so it goes, when the car sinks into the swamps, it's 20 minutes, so it's unbearably slow. And I put this in because that was a very early piece we did, and it's really about time. It's about sculpting time, and I think it's important to talk about Abramovich, that you really make time unbearably big, like an object, like a mountain, like something you have in front of you and you can't move. And I think that was a very important show we did. So I just wrote that down, sculpting time, seeing time. I think that's a very important thing as for me as a curator. So I go a little bit further. So we did these shows in Venice. Then we did a crazy space at Documenta in 97 where the main artist we had, Christoph Schlingensief, made a performance and he ended up in prison, which I thought was really amazing. You do something as an artist. And he was reenacting the first commune in 1968 in Germany. And he did it so well that the police thought it was real. But it's, it's a stage and documenta, biggest art show in the world. But still the police caught him, got him, and we made a demonstration with transparents and posters. And we had to free him from the police. But I'm saying this because I think it's very beautiful to think about the so Joseph Boy singing, founding a party, he as an artist ending up in prison. It's kind of kind of nice when these things don't are not separate. That's something that never looks that beautiful, but it looks beautiful on a photo. It's Cafe Bravo in Berlin. This is actually I think this is like a Carsten Höller slide. I'm only putting it because this is this courtyard. I think it's very funny, so it's a joke. It's not very really fine. And this is kind of Marina, and um, Marina and I, we know each other really well, because I think as a curator, sometimes you're a little lost. And so I met Marina on the 21st of June, 1992. That was the last day of that big show, where the whole street, every room was a show. And she was already known as a grandmother of performance art, but she was like a young grandmother. And I remember we had the closing, uh, like a little bit like here, we gave lectures about what was actually the show. And just imagine Inti would close our lecture and everybody would just like, whatever, clap a little bit and say like, fine, great. And she would walk in exactly when the applause happened. So she thought that was her applause. And that is a very good portrayal of who she is. She walks in, there's some applause, she thinks it's her applause. <laughs> and so she walks in and she said, oh, you should visit me in, in Amsterdam. And I was just a young curator, 25, and there comes this grandmother of performance art, says you should visit me in Amsterdam. Of course, next week, the next week I was in Amsterdam. So <laughs> but she was very surprised to see me on her doorstep. That was pre-internet. You would just go somewhere and knock. So. So I thought that was nice, but so actually the show at MoMA was 20 years in the making, which I think is actually an interesting thing, because I invited her then to do something in that ruin, and she kind of somehow always pushed it, so the first time we really did it was at MoMA. That was not a metaphor. This is books, Henry Dager and Matthew Barney and all stuff, because I'm, I'm just skipping this, because, but perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm not skipping this. Uh, I like things that are really, really long. And one of my closest artist allies is Matthew Bonney. And he did one piece in the 90s that's 11 hours long. And it's a cremaster cycle. And as he is my friend and I could never work with him and I could never afford working with him because he was always a star. When he was like already 23, he was like, great, can I just still talk to you? But so he made this amazing work over 10 years, and it's 11 hours long, but he made it not one, two, three, four, five. It has five pieces. He made it one, four, three, five, two. And I can never think, how can a person think for 10 years? I have short attention span. I make that, short, that speech very short because I will lose it. 
how can you think about something for 10 years? And then you see Henry Darger, that's two books I made. Henry Darger is a, is a work of an artist I'm obsessed with. He worked 60 years on one work. And it's a novel, it's 20,000 pages long. It's 300 watercolors of seven little girls fighting a war. But he worked on it for 60 years. I think this is wow. So, so my friend Matthew only worked on his Cream Master Cycle 10 years, but um, Henry Daga worked on his war, 20,000 pages, 300 of these watercolors for 60 years. I think that is pretty amazing. I did a show at MoMA with a one-year performance artist, Teqing Shi. He's from Taiwan. He jumped off a boat in the New York Harbor illegally, so he had no visa, no passport. And the first works he did were always one year long. So he put himself one year in a cage. No phone, no clock, no newspaper, no TV, no book, nothing productive and nothing entertaining. Just one year. So just imagine the sheer, just imagine just to sit here. So, and I think like after seven minutes, all of you would be gone, right, if you stop talking. Just imagine like, making you sit here for like a, a day and then another day and then another day and then a year it's like so i have no sense of time but i'm very obsessed with people who make time something that you could really make an object so henry daga did this for 60 years matthew but i think these one-year performances so he sat in a cage for one year he didn't sleep for one year so what basically what he did is he every Every hour, he went to a little punch clock with his piece of paper to punch in the clock and the photo was taken. So he could never be anywhere longer than 50 minutes because every hour he had to go to the clock. I think these are, he was one year outdoors, so he never was inside. He was one year kind of basically with a belt connected to his partner, Linda Montana. So I think it's a pretty outrageous work and I'm a huge fan of this work and this is the longest movie ever Berlin Alexanderplatz is 16 and a half hours and I made a book I persuaded a German publisher to his misfortune that I wanted to have a picture of every scene in the movie the book is a thousand pages long and yeah the movie is six, 16 and a half hours I wrote a text, so I had to watch these 16 and a half hours a couple of times. I watched them five times. I'm so proud. I'm so proud. But then, because of short attention span, I cut the movie in two-hour sections, and I presented them like behind every image is a little room, so you can be in the room and watch the first two hours, the second two hours. So you can actually watch all these hours and you can be in the middle and watch everything simultaneously so you can save time. <laughs> in this same vein, showing all the Kenneth Anger movies simultaneously, constantly in a space, it's all about being paranoid about time, right? And this is not paranoid. This is just generous and luscious and sexy and beautiful. Um, Pippi Lotti Rist, she did this huge work for MoMA and I commissioned her to do this and what she basically did is, you see this here, you could go to the main space at MoMA and you could lie down and be on a couch and be on the carpet and you could be a pig or a girl and there was music and you could walk, crawl through the apples but then Part of the scene is actually the girl standing in the water. So you have this girl just with like her white panties. And the girl is not a girl, she's a woman. And every month, the white becomes part of a color. And so she's bleeding. And so there she stands in the water and she's bleeding into her white panties and she is bleeding into the whole space because the whole space is filled with these gigantic images. Just imagine, America is so prudish, I'm German. Germany, you can be naked in the city, like Munich, everybody's naked in the city. There is, like in Berlin, there is a famous meadow, everybody's naked. But in America, you couldn't be naked in your own shower if there's a window. <laughs> 
So there she stands, and she's this image is really tall, and so she's bleeding, and so the blood covers, colors the whole atrium. And I thought, wow, here's a reason to get fired. <laughs> and strangely enough, so you see, that is actually the blood, because I. So it, it literally colors everything. And that was amazing for me as an experience that you could do something in an environment like MoMA, which is so outrageous that you think like, wow, this society is never going to get it. But they kind of took it. So there were some people like, oh, perhaps that's a little too much. But it worked. So I'm actually surprised. But it's, it's important to, to le learn about Marina. This Roman Ondak measuring the universe, you can come and like somebody's measuring your height and putting kind of like inti, if you would come, they would write inti and you make a little measurement of how high you are. And this is like after two months and having a lot of visitors. It's really like a cloud, right? I think it's quite beautiful. I propose this to MoMA to buy. It's a kiss. It's a girl and a boy in the middle. That's actually a picture from the Guggenheim. There shouldn't be any picture. Pictures are forbidden, but Tino knows I have this picture, so he's angry at me, but it's fine. Uh, it's a girl and a boy, and whenever you walk into the gallery, there are either before, during, or after a famous kiss that you might know from a painting or a sculpture. But you come in in the morning at 10, and those two people are kissing. You come in at lunchtime and these two people are kissing. And you come in, come in in the afternoon and these two people are kissing. So it's basically, if this is an object and you put it here, if this is an object on a pedestal, of course it's going to be there at 10 in the morning, of course it's going to be there at lunch, of course it's going to be in the afternoon. So why should it not be there? But why should this, if this is a sculpture, not be there in the gallery? And the funny thing is you're not allowed to photograph it, so this photo is illegal. You're not allowed to have a contract, you're not allowed to have any paperwork, and you're not allowed to write anything down. So I propose the museum to pay to buy it, but what do you buy? Because you don't buy the two people. You don't even get a contract. And it was, it was quite expensive, it was 2,000 euros at the time. So that was a good exercise, but I'm saying between kind of bleeding into the atrium, measuring everybody, having people kissing in the atrium. This was all, I think, necessary to make the marina show possible because I think you could have not, we could have not done marina as an exhibition without having these other things in the museum. And it was, oh, we have this already, right? We bought a kiss and we're bleeding in the atrium and we are kind of playing piano upside down, backwards, Alora and Calcedia, which was at MoMA. And then, this is Tae Ching. This is a one-year artist, actually, who did this one year in a cage or one year in the time clock, no sleep. And what Marina did is basically very simple. It's basically a little table, and it's a chair, and it's another chair. And the idea was that she would sit there for three months, every day, morning, lunch, afternoon. She would never, ever get up. She would never ever get to the bathroom. She would never ever eat or drink or pee or whatever. She would just sit there. She would just sit there and there would be an empty chair across from her. And because she's not doing anything, we thought this chair would be empty. But you could take the chair and just sit with her. But we literally actually thought that the other chair would be empty. Because how would you think people why want to sit there? So this became quite a sensation in New York. And people were lining up and coming from Australia and sleeping in front of the museum and waiting for 10 hours. And there were actually some people where you saw it became quite a crazy scene. One person sat actually for seven and a half hours. So he came in the morning and he would not leave. But we couldn't also get him out because why would you get him out? Because he can sit there as long as he wants, right? So everybody else waiting that day was very frustrated. And then it became a, quite a sensation. And so when I said this Lady Gaga is here, so she came or everybody came. 
and it was in the news and nobody got it. It was like mainstream news. They said, oh, there's this woman sitting at MoMA. They actually said, oh, there's this woman sitting at the Metropolitan Museum. It didn't even get the museum right. I thought it was funny. But it became this thing that in the three months, New York is so hectic, you would know, wow, she's going to sit there, right? So you could be there. You would know one thing is constant. It might rain or shine, but she's going to sit there. And that became, because nobody looks at you in New York, and she looked at everybody like forever. And nobody has time in New York, and she had all the time there was. She would just sit there. And that was quite beautiful. So, And it's connected to so many pieces she did over like whatever, 40 years of her career. Show you a couple of other pictures. So you see she had the first, she had a red rope on, and then she had a white rope on, and then there was also a blue one. And I have to say, I hated these ropes. I think they were not necessary. They were stupidly decorative. They were pompous. They were vain. I really hated them, but then, when you work with a curator, you understand perhaps she needs it to sit there because you need to hold on to something, right? Or you need something, or you need a, a bottle or something. And I think what she needed was literally this funny rope for her to feel better. And then I also, of course, understood it's very warm because there's no wind and it's a little bit like your own little tent. And the funny thing is that after two months, there was always that, I show you, there was always a table, you see. But after two months, we realized you don't actually need the table. So we took, took the table away, which made it like so crazy because then there was no protection. And people really went crazy. I was very afraid she would get killed or stabbed or somebody would. There were people kind of like, one person had a frozen rat. So she came up saying, I have a present and she gave her a rat. There was a, one person who had a mirror in front of, she had a hat on and she lowers the hat and it's a mirror, so Marina would see herself. There was another girl who kind of like walked and then she swapped her dress and she was naked. It was kind of nice, everything, kind of whatever people thought. And then there were people throwing stuff from upstairs and so it was pretty crazy actually. Here you see imponderabilia, you see it perhaps better here. So that's two girls, and it was not, we thought we should be metrosexual, which was stupid. I think it should have been girl, boy, boy, girl. But we thought we are so cool. We have girls, girls, and boys, boys, and girls and boys, and boys and girls. But I think it should be a couple. I think it should always be, because it's yes and no, and it's not yes and yes and no and no. It's not about being sexual, actually. So people had to... Normally have to decide whether you look at the girl or the boy, but stupid ass, we had two girls or two boys. So where do you look? You don't know. It was very funny. There were 750,000 people going to the And out of the 750,000 people, I would say three of them, which is like nothing. Like through, they walk through. Of course, your hand is somewhere here, and so you touch something when you walk through those two guys. But only three of these people did this, and so it's actually quite behaving. I was actually quite surprised that people were really respectful and they weren't like grabbing people or like harassing them. There was this point of contact where two people stand with their fingers trying to keep the fingers aligned by that for longer than 10 minutes. Performing so much. There was another one, two pieces, two people, relation in time, connected with their hair. It was a drama to get that done. But here is kind of like I said, there was, Pipilotti was bleeding in the atrium, there was a kiss, there were all these things we did before at the museum that I think our audience, our trustees, and all the staff 
were fine, that we would do something very outrageous. I think that was important. We had a work artist, like performance artist, and we asked the artist, like, like a little bit like the round here, and we would discuss what are we allowed to do. But Te Ching was there, Paul Chen was there, Matthew Barney was there, Joan Joan Ono was there, the curators were there. Amongst ourselves, the museum and the artists decided for an experiment. We are allowed to reperform. We are allowed to reperform a piece that's from 1977 or here from 1980 and do it again. And we do it again because we want to give the audience that's here and now the experience of seeing that. It was an experiment, we all agreed, and we did it. And so there was no big explosion saying, oh, Museum of Modern Art is crazy now. So we had an agreement amongst all the performance artists that came over two years, every three months to the workshop, that we do that as an experiment. And as a curator, I think that this experiment, if we had stayed with a girl and boy, would have been great. I think this experiment was just fine, and I think this experiment didn't work. I thought it didn't make any sense. But then you saw Marina floating in front of the wall with her arms spread, and you just walk into a room, and there's a person like Jesus, or is a person like a holy person levitating, and you don't know what that is. You first think it's a projection of a film, or it's a video, or it's a slide. And then you understand, oh no, there is a person on the wall. And I think that worked really well. That was very, very strong. And I would still think we should buy this as a museum. What do you buy? You buy the right to put a person up on the wall, right? So you don't buy the person, you don't buy anything, but the right to do this. So I go a little bit further through. So it was also a real retrospective. This was a very, very successful piece that Marina did originally herself. Basically, there's a shelf. So, like, look at the pedestal, and there's Marina on the pedestal under or with a skeleton. And we did that in the show with other people, and it's just fine. You don't need Marina with a skeleton. You can have every person. You all have a skeleton inside of you, so it just, it just works fine. And that was really quite stunning. This is a piece... I mention, which is Luminosity, which we actually premiered in Berlin a hundred years ago. But I think that's actually quite beautiful, and she's just, this is another person that's not Marina. You see 97 and 2010, and yeah, I think with this slide perhaps I just stop and I'm ready for questions. Because this, this lecture goes on for another seven hours until my plane goes. <laughs> Are there any questions? Inti is a good moderator. <laughs> no, thank you, Phil. Um, I think that I yeah, couldn't help uh, by wonder that to remind everybody that we're actually in a museum no, here. And what we uh, saw was like the possibilities of how can a museum expand the idea of what it shows, what it collects. Um, how to reenact no? um, performance and uh, make, imagine the retrospective of a performance artist is actually like a whole mission, no? Yeah. And um, I don't know if I would like, yeah, to open, uh, because I, I think that it's really urgent like for people to be here in the audience who have like some questions that, or not even questions, I always think that, uh, Maybe you liked something or would like to point out something that you would like for Klaus to expand. That necessarily you don't have to build a specific question. It would be it would be good like to have this opportunity. Yes. Um, I am very much, um, we are all, I think, honored to have you here. I saw the show myself and was astonished and overwhelmed by the amount of work she's done over her life and, though, and the intensity because 
at times I felt that some of the performers didn't have her intensity, probably because she felt so much what she was doing at that time with her husband, especially in the pairing of the performances. And um, I found a very, for that to be a very exciting show, a exhibition, especially because you had Marina herself there. You could feel her, even with the robe, you know, in white that I experienced. And um, so the endurance work she shows, and you all show over the exhibition, is, is an amazing, uh, unique, I think, example of performance in the concept of time, as you said. I was going to ask you, um, how did you choose the performers for the show? What was the training they went through to be able to be there and represent her in the best way possible? Yeah, it's not as easy, I think, actually. Yeah. No, there were two. You actually have a hidden question and a real question. I think the hidden question is, oh, she has this intensity even in the world, which implies that she didn't have the intensity. This is a museum. You have the right to put sign things in storage. When you collect it, or even if you don't collect it, you have the responsibility that you keep the artwork in shape, alive or intact. And we are in a museum, so you know what it is, but you have to keep it, you have to conserve it, preserve it. So how do you do this with performance? I can't get Joseph Boyce here and sing that song, but still he did like amazing pieces. Can you reenact his pieces? I don't know. Uh, with Marina, we tried it. Some succeeded, some failed. Just put this up here, that's a work by Laura Lima. It's a person you lower the ceiling all the way down and there's a person lying under the ceiling which is basically just allows you to just breathe and it's so scary. Or here that's a piece by Zhu Zhen, a Chinese artist, where a person is falling backwards but caught in mid-air. That's my iPhone picture here. That's of three identical twins it's a work by Damien Hirst, and it doesn't look like a Damien Hirst piece. There are two dot paintings, and see the dots are not identical. And then there are the two identical twins, the girls, the two identical twins, the guy with the red polo shirt, and the two identical twins with the scarf. But to the same questions. So you have this identical situation. And these pieces are all pieces that you do reenact because I think it would be great if Laura Lima or Jason Hurst would always be there. But it's in this case, it's, this is not Laura, this is of course. You have an artist like Laura incredible. Lima dropped charismatic. And in that movie that I'm going to send Inti, I basically say I had to divorce from her because I couldn't do a show with her and she would have a spell on me. I said, you have no power over me. I have power over you. Because otherwise I can't work with you as an artist. So, has to do, right? Marina was 12 years with Ulai her partner where she did all these pieces where she was basically walking by kind of like and they touch each other when they kind of like go through space were both born on November 30th they did pieces where they basically bound themselves to each other there's a very famous piece they're slapping each other until they can't do it anymore. It's just like she gives him a slap, he and... There's another very famous piece where they have a bow and arrow, and he is holding the arrow and the bow, 
and pointing it at, at her heart and they're leaning backwards and just this tension because of course if he loses it the arrow goes into her and the fear and they have microphones in their shirts so they had this incredibly intense Situations. They meet in 1975, they're born the same day, they have wild sex, they are greatly in love, and they have 12 years of love and life, and art is life and life is art. It's fantastic. They live in a little van and travel Europe, and she's knitting sweaters and milking goats, and he is lazy or whatever, but they have a fantastic life as lovers. They were the lovers. They kind of like in front of the Paris Biennial, in a car, a circle in front of the building, 2,226 circulations until the car breaks down. It's like, so then in 1988, it's a long planned piece, they have the two ends of the Chinese wall, that's what you said, and they walk from the two ends of the Chinese wall, from both ends trying to meet in the middle. He has already his fragment. She is whatever, losing it, and they meet she's crying and whatever, so they split forever. They haven't talked after this for like seven years or so. So there is this incredible, there is a person who's intense, right? So, it was very funny when we did MoMA, she wanted to be, we had the wall, it's very tall. She wanted to have seven shelves, the seven decades of her life. And she wanted to descend into being a normal person. So she wanted to kind of with a skeleton and wind and a dress and so she would go shelf by shelf all the way down to arrive with us earthlings. But she also split with her husband. An Italian artist, three years before the show. So two years before the show, I have a wreck of an artist in front of me. She's crying, she does not eating, she has to go to a doctor. The doctor said, oh, you should take some pills against depression. And I said, don't take any pills. Because I thought if you cure her, she's not an artist anymore, right? So she has to be sad, in a way. <laughs> and so one year before the performance, MoMA has already built the shelves. We had already the iron in the wall for the shelves. We go to the Dia Foundation and look at Soluit wall drawings and the Michael Heitzer, the negative space. And she was literally so depressed. So she looks at the Soluit and she starts crying. And I said, Marina, I can't work with you. We have a big show in one year. You're not getting better. So we sit in the Michael Heitzer and we look down in the space. I said, Marina, that's the atrium. You're so sad. Why don't you just make that sadness a work? You are alone. You had Ulai, you had your husband. Why don't you just sit alone in the atrium? Isn't that a beautiful self-portrait? And she melted down. She was crying. But then she did this piece with all her life. It's a self-portrait. It's kind of like it's a self-portrait. And I think when you look at her, sitting here, nobody could have done this piece because this is literally her being her, overly dramatic, thinking she's Maria Callas, <laughs> and being in love. And you could never have anybody. We toured the show to Moscow and we decided nobody could do that because how could you do that? In one side, in one side, you say that it's autobiographical, film and nobody can do her work. Yes, but on the other side, you re, uh, re perform what she did. No, I'm, I'm. Thank you for saying this. I'm trying to make the difference. I think some works are connected to her charisma and her personality, and you cannot, cannot re-perform them. But some works are. I think performance is like there's some musical pieces that can only be played by the composer, and there's some musical pieces that might need an otherworldly voice or a talent or some odd thing that only one person in the world. I actually have an example of this. 
I'm a huge fan, and I think he's not known here. I'm a huge fan of Anthony, Anthony and the Johnsons. He's like around 40, he is, he is a she, so he would not say, he would, I would say he or she. An otherworldly voice, and I did a performance with him in Radio City, which fits 6,000 people. So just imagine, it's not like 50 people, it's 6,000 people. But all of you would still spend a night with him. All of you would think you spend an, an incredibly intimate moment with him. I cannot replace this. He has a unique voice. Marina has a unique presence when she does The Artist is Present. But there are other pieces like Hanging on the Wall. I can't do it, but somebody who's fit could do it. So there is a little bit, there are some unique pieces only the artist him or herself can do, like only Anthony could do or only Marina could do, but there are other pieces and that's about the artist. Like Bruce Nauman, he did those famous, famous, not actually famous, it's actually funny, the Bruce Nauman pieces are actually what Tino Segal 30 years later does as a living. They are kind of like pieces where a body always touches the floor and the wall constantly throughout the exhibition. So there's a person touching the floor and the wall, so you mean like touching both surfaces, and that's just a person, it's not Bruce Nauman, it can be anybody. That can be anybody. But then the famous Bruce Nauman where he is a fountain, that's definitely him, it couldn't, couldn't be anybody else. So you have to ask the artist, is this a work that you think somebody else can do, or is this a work only you can do? It's decided by the artist when the artist is alive, and I think when the artist is not alive, you can't decide it. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you exactly. It's a little, it's a boring answer, but I tell you. <laughs> Tino comes in with two people from the gallerist and a lawyer and a notary and 12 people from the museum. So you're sitting there with 15 people and he tells you you're not allowed to write anything down. The kiss should be the average duration of any show in your museum. Shouldn't be an event, it's not a performance, has to be treated like an exhibition, has to be read has to be done by two trained people that he doesn't call read performers but interpreters, who have to be trained by an authorized instructor that comes instructed from him. They have to be trained dancers, they have to go through a certain procedure, you're not allowed to document it, you're not allowed to do this or that. So there's a whole two hour speech that 15 people listen to, and you're not allowed to write down. And you have to kind of perform the piece, Tino would kill me for that word perform, you have to activate the piece every two years, because otherwise these people will be gone, and they will be in Hollywood, or they're in pension, or whatever. So you have to, it's oral history. There's nothing written, no written record. And when those people get older, you know, on the next generation, <laughs> Interesting question. I, th I have this very no, but I have this very very funny thing that I think my hard drive is full. Like when you have your computer and the hard drive is full, like your iPhone, you can't take pictures anymore. I think my brain doesn't compute anything anymore, <laughs> so I forget things. But I hope that the other. 14 people don't. No, but it's, it's a valid question. I think we have to re-perform it, we have to activate it every two years to have that round of 15 people who sit there. It was very funny, we did Yvonne Rayner, Rhythm, as one of the Rhythms, Rhythm 3, and when you do this, you have everybody there, and still the performance is totally different. She comes in and says, that has nothing to do with what my piece is. So, but then look at a Dan Flevin, you have like neon light tubes and then they're not produced anymore or 
look at 16 millimeter projection and there are no projectors anymore. There's many pieces were made for a TV monitor that was a box, like a box, right? They used to be, TVs used to be boxes and not flat. And they were meant because many play with the idea it's deep. So how do you show that on a flat screen? It's not flat. So it's not easy. Um, I'm curious to, to, to know your uh, opinion about thinking that um, how the fact that Tino Sigal um, asks his pieces to be rem remembered orally or without any written, yeah. could it be just to allow the piece to change with the memory of the people or to, yeah. no, it's just... Okay, because I mean, memory changes. I mean, you tell a story once, and then the next time you tell the story, you change it a little bit, and so on. So I'm wondering. Is anybody here who's a dancer? Dancers. See, there's a couple. Of them. <laughs> Tino is trained as a dancer and an economist. So the whole idea of no contract, money, this is great performance, this, everything. This is very much the economist. But then a dancer has the idea of muscle memory. When you dance, you have a muscle memory, so you know what you do, which is something that we don't know, like I'm not a dancer, I don't know. But there is something like a muscle memory. There's something like an economic logic, which I also do know. But I think between these, he's very, 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 very rigid. Um, just. Oh, um, I was wondering at the beginning you were talking about um when you when you were uh, proposing the marina piece for the show or the pupillati wrist and what you were able to do and what you're not able to do um and uh what the way that you see yourself you know and, and the way that you were interested in joseph boys as an artist because he was able to do uh to activate this like political conscious in the in in germany at this specific moment in time i wonder um how you as a curator relate to the institution and therefore to the mass media as a sort of like what what your agenda if, if there is an agenda to you know to perpetuate some sort of dissidence or maybe some I don't know, I just is there my role at And I think more is disruption within the city and within MoMA. So I think some institutions, some people have that role to break a narrative or to start a new narrative. Or And of course, that's mostly an artistic role. But if you specialize on this as a curator, you have to consequently kind of follow them, right? This was kind of funny, because this is craft work at MoMA. We invited, I don't know who knows Kraftwerk, there are like four people, actually it's only one person now, but there are three others, and they started, you have, to, you have to drive on a highway, I can't drive, but I drive with friends, I can't, don't know how to do that, but you are in a car, and please try that to listen to their song Autobahn, it's longer than 20 minutes, and you hear a car starting, and you hear the sound of the road, of the highway, and it's just long, it's like 20 minutes, so you can get somewhere. And they started with a word like Autobahn, then they have an image of a an highway. And for me, they're the ultimate artist of like image and sound and everything together. But of course, some people think they are a band and they do music, 
I think they're not a band and I don't think they're doing music. I think they're artists and they have a Gesamtkunstwerk that I so much understand because I'm German and I know Autobahn and I know how to drive, not myself, but I know how it feels. So convincing the whole museum to spend more than a million dollars on inviting them to play everything they did from the 70s on until today as a retrospective. So the first night they played the first album, the second night they played the second album, the third night they played the third album, the fourth, da, 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 da. So there were two weeks, every night they played one album once, and we made that crazy space that literally only fits 450 people because we put, put this huge sound system in. And so, I think sometimes a museum, museum always follows, 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 but sometimes a museum also has to kind of make a statement in a way. And I think with Marina, the museum fortunately made a statement, and I don't know if it was right or wrong, but it was really a statement. And as a curator, you're not making the statement because she does this for, what you said, she does it for 40 years, right? She's 66 now, she does it when she was 19, so that's 47 years, that's, wow, that's pretty long. Those guys do that for 30 years, so. It's all about the artists, so. huh? And it's not that, that's your original comments. It wasn't, it wasn't all the original members. No, it was just one original member. No, but what I'm trying to say is the museum and the curators have to follow the artist, and hopefully the museum and the artist work together, and hopefully they're courageous enough to risk it. Because this Kraftwerk thing was very risky. But having all these naked people in New York, like kind of where you were there, people walking through, and they were not all girls. They were like fully fledged, whatever, walking through the exhibition fully naked. And that is not, a, I don't know, would that work here? Could you have like a show with a couple of naked people in that you would just? <laughs> so we stop that here. <laughs> With this, we stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I was saying that we should answer that question. I, I think. Um, is it short? <laughs> Your question. Mine. You also had another question. Okay. Okay, let's co let let's do this. Let's collect uh, three because maybe some things sometimes like questions overlap. So let's collect three and then. What next challenging project you have after these things? I think in a funny way, every project is challenging. I seeing Carlos here. We did a very challenging project a couple of years ago, and every single project I think is challenging because you don't know where you're going. I'm thinking of doing a world's fair. <laughs> so it's like, wow, that's perhaps challenging. <laughs> it's like putting yourself too many cookies on your plate or something. Where? I, huh? Where? Let's think about it, I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> actually great. It's only two, not three. The what? Of oh, the question? <laughs> I wanted to ask you, it's very interesting with the piece where the couple is in the entrance, because I remember seeing it like the original documentation long ago, and of course the choice is either you look for a man or you yeah. look for a woman. And No, the picture. <laughs> that was not really, I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, what made you choose differently? Because, of course, when you put two women, you neutralize that decision, yeah. or two men. Mistake. But was it that because of cultural reasons? Like, I don't know. they have no idea what being gay means. They have no word for that. 
so you're like a man or a woman, right? So I remember introducing Marina and Susan Sontag and Marina was like, oh God, does she like women and men? I said, I don't know. She might like you or not. It's not depending on if you're a woman or not. But, and then Susan Sontag said, Marina, there's no word in your language for being gay. So I think we wanted to be super smart and think, oh God, we're so cool. So it's not about girls and boys anymore. It could be anything and it's wrong. Because there are two shapes, and there are more shapes, but there's this shape and that shape, and it's yin and yang, and yes and no, and it was a mistake. I would never do that again. I think it was a stupid mistake. Stupid, too cool for school. It was just wrong. Could I add something to that? Sorry. Yeah, but yeah? what was your question? No, it was a but that something changed historically. This piece was about Ulai and Marina, and I think it was a mistake to open it to everything. I'm gonna add something to that because, well, I don't know. I would actually say that the how I saw it was that the decision was like pure American political correctness. No, it was actually no? my assistant Erica <laughs> trying to be smart. <laughs> no, it was. It, it, yes, it looked real. We try to be, I know remember Erica said, Klaus, we in New York, we are metrosexual, and she's like 25 or so. And I said, really? And it was stupid. We should have kept the girl voice. Maybe, maybe I, uh, I, I also thought that, I, I, I actually find it weird that if you have like a man or a woman that what, like facing, uh, one another does not exclude the sexuality between each other. <laughs> because if I were to face a woman, I would actually desire still the man. You know, so <laughs> I wouldn't exactly feel like the desire is solely retinal, no? No, but it's a portrait of the person walking through yeah. desiring the woman or the man yeah. or uh, admitting who he or she desires, because there were many people that I know like this or that, and they turned the other way to be super discreet. So it's it's it's, it's more complex. Yeah, that creates a problem. Yeah, yeah. Want to add something here? that you put all the um, dates of the, her journal with small photographs. I found that overwhelming. It just... <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so striking. A very strong piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm.